Hello, my name is Grace Hayek on behalf of the Glencoe Public Library. I welcome you to our program, Speaking with the Dead, What Bones Can Tell Us About Life in the Past. We're delighted to welcome back our presenter, Ellen Green, who's joining us from London, hence the one o'clock starting time. The library is grateful to the Friends of the Glencoe Public Library for supporting this visiting professor's event. Thank you, friends. After working as a field archeologist in London for five years, Ellen Green returned to academia. She's currently working on a PhD at the University of Reading. She spe specializes in bioarchaeology with a focus on ancient burial practices during the late Iron Age and early Roman periods in England. Much of her, re her research is finding and examining human and animal remains found in odd places. This is her eighth program for us. It's been such a pleasure to know to learn not only more about archaeology, but also to see her very interesting career unfold. Since 2016, Ellen has brought us wonderful lectures on London archaeology, Roman London industrial archaeology, historical cures and quackery, sacrifice and ritual in Iron Age Britain with the priceless title of All Torque and No Trousers, Warrior Women and Dogs in the Ancient World. The dogs program went viral and ended up drawing viewers from 26 countries. Ellen, it's really nice to have you here again. Please go ahead. Thank you, Grace, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be speaking to you all. Uh, I've really enjoyed my time with Glencoe Library. Um, and the subject today is something that is very near and dear to my heart, as you might have gleaned from Grace's wonderful intro. Um, studying skeletons is what I do professionally. So quite a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is kind of an insight into my day-to-day -day research life. Um, so I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, there we go. So I find when I talk to my students that there are two main perceptions people come in with when they are thinking about how we learn from skeletons and what sort of information we can get. And those two perceptions are really quite extreme. One is the students that have watched shows like Bones or CSI and who are of the opinion that skeletons can tell you absolutely everything from age and sex estimations to how they died to are they left or right-handed and what their favorite color was. The other half of students don't think skeletons can tell you much at all. And usually when you ask them about what sort of information you can get from graves or tombs, really focus only on the artifacts, on the pottery and things like that. But actually skeletons can tell you quite a lot, albeit not quite as much as CSI and Bones would have you believe. Bioarchaeology, which is the branch of archaeology that really looks at skeletons is actually a relatively new field, however. It really only came into being in the 1980s. Uh, before that, skeletons weren't particularly considered a very good source of information when it came to things like estimating the sex of people in graves. Uh, they tended to just use grave goods, which is not a great idea because it tends to lead to really circular arguments about only men are buried with swords. Uh, Therefore, if there's a sword, it must be a man. And this has been disproven on multiple levels. Um, and it means that a lot of old excavations, much to my chagrin when I'm doing my research, they didn't necessarily retain the bones. Uh, Victorians in particular had an obsession with skulls, but often just threw everything else out. Uh, this is very much in modern archeological practice frowned upon. We like to keep and record everything. So the first thing really to consider when you come across bones, be it walking your dog or on an archaeological dig, is are they human? Because obviously there are very different legal ramifications for animal bones than there are human. And in terms of archaeology, excavation techniques are somewhat different, um, especially if you find a what we call articulated human, so a human body that's still together with all the bones in roughly the right place. Um, then you have to be a lot more careful about it and you have to take a lot more notes. But telling whether or not bones are human or animal is not always as easy as you would think. I have found generally in my experience, um, people who aren't trained in bio arc 
unless you have a whole human skull, tend to struggle, especially if bones are fragmented, which they often are. And even professionals sometimes struggle. So this picture here is a comparison. Uh, this is a bear paw on the left, and this is a human hand on the right. And you can actually see really how similar they are in terms of the individual bones. So if you just found isolated bones in the woods, and you weren't incredibly familiar with what human hands look like, it, it's very reasonable that you would make that mistake. And in fact, my housemate, who is a coroner, um, who worked as a coroner in Pennsylvania, got called out on a lot of sort of false alarms where people thought they'd found human remains in the woods and it turned out just to be bear paws. This picture on the left is a sort of comparison. Um, this is really to make a point about sort of mammal anatomy generally. The thing about bones is that even though animals are very different shapes, is that the basic bones are all kind of the same shape. So this is a femur, which is your thigh bone. And this small one's a dog, the slightly bigger one's a pig. The one in the middle is a human, and the one on the far right is a horse. They're all kind of the same shape. And while they're different sizes, sizes can be really misleading because you can get bigger, smaller animals and bigger and smaller people. So you can see why, if they're fragmented, it's not necessarily as difficult, uh, as easy as it might first appear. One interesting thing, though, is that human bones do have a slightly different texture to animal bones. I really don't know why this is, but it is something if you work with bones that you notice quite quickly. And if I'm working with really fragmented commingled assemblages, which I do a lot of the time, um, what the actual texture of the bone feels like is often my first clue as to whether or not it's human or animal. So you've established that your bones are human. The next step on an archeological site really then is excavation. And there's actually a lot of information that you can get on excavation that if you don't record it at that stage is lost when you're looking at bones in the lab. So it's really quite a holistic process trying to learn about individuals. You need both the information from the actual dig um, and from the grave as much as you do the actual skeleton. So when you excavate skeletons archaeologically, skeletons have their own unique recording form. Uh, this is an example in the middle here of the one my old company used to use. It to describe the positioning of every single part of the body, um, as well as mark which bones you have. Because actually it's quite common when you dig up a skeleton to not have all the bones. This is because soil processes and decomposition mean that not everything always survives. Um, even in the best of conditions, it's it's common to lose sort of the smaller uh, bones of the hands and feet. Um, and then in some circumstances, your skeleton just gets truncated by later, uh, later things. So this one here, um, that's being excavated by one of my co-workers, there was a ditch cut in the later Roman period that just went right through the bottom of the grave and cut that Roman's feet off. So these two skeletons that you can see actually on this slide are both from the same graveyard. They're both Roman um, from Suffolk in London. The graves were actually quite close to each other physically, but as you can note, they're really very different. So this one on the right is what we'd consider a very normal grave for the Roman period. It's got this nice big square rectangular grave cut. Your body is lying nicely on its back, hands extended at the sides. Um, one interesting thing about this though, and this is what I mean about details that can really only be gleaned at excavation, is that these points here are coffin nails. So we know this individual was in a coffin, even though the coffin is rotted away. And actually you can see, although it is a bit difficult in this photo, the collarbones here have sort of been pushed up, so they're almost vertical. This happens when bodies decompose in a very uh, confined space, so we know that the coffin wasn't very wide, and we can sort of start to reconstruct some of how this body was buried, even though we don't necessarily have everything. Now let's contrast with this body on the left. This body is in a pit. It doesn't have a nice dedicated grave cut the way the one on the right does. 
and the pit was not big enough for the body, as you can see from the head leaning on the edge there. This body hasn't been laid out nicely, and in fact, the positioning of the arm is somewhat suggestive that this person had their hands bound when they died. Or at least when they were buried. So you can see even within the same graveyard, and these skeletons when they're in the lab, you wouldn't know these things. It's only by looking at how the bodies are when you first find them that we can sort of work these things out, which is why it's very important for excavation and lab work to go together. This is a wonderful case study, um, which again shows how important it is for excavation and lab to go together, talking about British mummies, which I bet you didn't know were a thing. I didn't know they were a thing until we covered these in my undergrad, and this is truly an amazing site. So there are two of these mummies, and they were found on a site called Clada Hallen, uh, which is in the Outer Hebrides, which are islands in Scotland. They are wet, they are cold, and they are remote. Um, and in the Bronze Age, so about 1000 BC, they had mummies. Uh, but when they were first dug up, you couldn't tell that they were mummies. So this is one of them. And you can see this looks like one person. They're tightly flexed, so they would have been wrapped when they were buried in order to have sort of contained this very tight position. Um, but when they were looking at these bodies, some of the bones didn't seem really to fit very well together in the lab. So they radiocarbon dated a whole bunch of them, and they found out that some of the bones were literally hundreds of years apart, which is not physically possible if this was all one person. So it it's really hard. You couldn't lay bones out like this and get them in the, such a perfect position from different people, which implies that while these different people, bits of different people were put together, there must have been flesh on, which, but hundreds of years apart, right? Which leads to a question of how is that possible? Well, they did DNA uh, analysis on the Bronze Age mummies, and they found that there are at least six different people uh, represented here. And interestingly, they looked at the bone on a microscopic level and they determined that the bones were probably, well, not the bones, but the body as a whole was probably subject to mummification, probably via um, a peat bog. So they would have put the bodies in the peat bog to let them preserve and then stitch different bits together to create this. And it it really does look like one individual. Um, now, the, bron <laughs> the climate of Scotland did not keep these peat bog mummies uh, intact for the thousands of years until archaeologists found them. So again, it's really only by combining all these different techniques that we were able to work that out. It's also interesting when they did the radiocarbon dates, these mummies were buried um, three between 300 and 600 years after they died. So they were probably in use as, I don't know, a religious item or some kind of totem in the societies that they were made in for quite a while before they were redeposited and reburied. So one of the most important things when you are trying to look at a skeleton is to establish at what age they died. It's one of the very first things you do when you get a skeleton in the lab um, and it can be quite useful uh, for looking for other things. How you do this, depends on whether you're looking at an adult uh, or a younger individual. Because interestingly, due to the way humans grow, adults have 206 bones in their body, but babies can have 806. This is because when you are a child, your bones are actually made of lots of smaller bones that as you get older fuse together. So just to illustrate this, here's a femur again, and you can see this this is an adult femur, all nice, one piece, big leg bone. This one is from about a 10 year old child and you can see that the ends haven't fused on um, and they would be connected in the body with cartilage. And then as you get older, that cartilage grows, allowing you to grow um, and then solidifies into bone as you get older. 
So this is an in-between state where you can just see the end fusing on. This is from uh, actually one of my skeletons I'm looking at for my PhD. Um, this is a Roman woman uh, in her late teens, probably sort of between 18 and 20. And you can just see uh, where her arm bone is fusing on, which is how we can get such a nice tight date range. This green staining, by the way, is because she was wearing um, copper bracelets or copper alloy bracelets. They might have been bronze. It's nothing to do with her health. The last bone in your body to fuse is your clavicle, which is your collarbone, and that fuses around 25. After your 25, getting an age estimation is much more difficult. You can do it, but it's a wide category. You can only really get 10 year sort of categories. And once you are over 45, none of the age methods work particularly well. They're not very accurate. So when we're looking at skeletons and we're doing age estimations for older individuals, 45 plus is so, tends to be the highest category for age. Um, I know when I turn 45 and from that point on, I'm just going to tell people I'm an unageable adult, it's, at least archeologically speaking. Um, when you do age estimation in adults, you do use the pelvis. Uh, as Shakira said, hips do not lie and they are very, very useful things. And you tend to use two different parts of the pelvis. This is the auricular surface, which is where your pelvis attaches to your spine. And this is the pubic symphysis, which is where the two halves of your pelvis sort of fit together in the front. And as you get older, uh, and as your body experiences wear and tear, I'm sad to say these two parts of your body do somewhat degenerate. And we look at the level of degeneration to try and get an age estimate. So this is the pubic symphysis when you're very young. This is a 20 year old. And this is somebody uh, in the 45 plus category. And you can see this sort of nice billowing is just completely worn away and you've got some sort of lipping on the edge. Um, we have plaster casts that we use to do this. Sex estimation, also very important, also follows the Shakira rule of hips are the most honest, uh, certainly the most accurate way to get a sex estimation. But sex estimation is probably not as straightforward as you think. First of all, archaeologically, we actually have five different categories for sex estimation. Female, probably female, indeterminate, probably male, and male. This is because Humans are actually not a terribly sexually dimorphic species. Uh, men and women skeletons tend to look pretty much the same, except for a few small things. Um, I've had people ask me about ribs before. Men and women do have the same number of ribs. That doesn't work as a sexing technique. Um, but the thing about sex estimation is that your hips because of the birthing process, do tend to be the most sexually dynamorphic part of a person. So you can't do sex estimation on children because the sort of changes you look at only happen after puberty because it's the release of estrogen and testosterone into your system that causes these changes. So with the hips, you generally, wider, broader hips are more female. Um, you look at the subpubic angle and sort of the sciatic notch and see how wide they are. Uh, also, the sacrum, which is this bit in the back, tends to be more curved in men. You can do sex estimation also using the skull. It is not as accurate as using the pelvis. Um, and often the pelvis and the skull don't necessarily agree, um, in which case the pelvis is more accurate. But it's interesting because young men often look very feminine and old women often look very masculine um particularly in the skulls so that can really complicate um trying to work this out it's certainly not as easy again as they make it look in forensic shows so what you do has a massive effect on your body and fashion is no exception to that Mostly when people talk about how fashion impacts skeletons, they usually give examples either from China and talk about foot binding or from Mesoamerica and talk about um, the sort of modified skulls you get due to 
sort of shaping people's skulls with boards when they're babies. But I wanted to talk about an example that is perhaps a little closer to home, at least for me, and that's corsets. In the Victorian period, uh, tight lace corsets were fashionable. Corsets have been in use in women's clothing for years and years and years. They weren't new in the Victorian period, but the ones in the Victorian period were particularly tightly boned and particularly designed to get that hourglass silhouette. And people wore them, women wore them from when they were young girls. And the thing about wearing something restrictive when you're growing is that your bones grow into a different shape. So the average waist in corsets uh, in the Victorian period, they reckon was about 22 inches. They worked it out by measuring some uh, existing corsets in the Victorian Albert Museum. 22 inches is a good 10 inches smaller than the average UK waist size today. Uh, I certainly would not fit in a 22 inch corset. And it caused deformations both to the spine and to the ribs. You can see the ribs sort of make this very weird sort of oval shape, whereas a natural rib cage actually just comes out and is quite wide at the bottom, as opposed to being narrower, which it is in the corseted ones. But what's been interesting about research on uh, corset modifications and ribs is that there doesn't appear to be any correlation between these modifications and age at death. So while people often suggest that corsets were very unhealthy and caused early death in women, this doesn't actually seem to be being supported by the archaeological evidence. Many of the women that were studied uh, to look at corset modifications in London appear to have lived just as long as everybody else. There's no deviation. So while sometimes things look very dramatic on the skeleton, that doesn't necessarily translate to how much they would have affected people in life, which is an important lesson to keep in mind. Um, activity can also uh, impact your bones. The way that bones work is that your muscles attach to them. That's how the human body works. And muscle attachments on bone sort of grow in proportion to the muscle. So if you have really, really big muscles, you tend to have really, really robust muscle attachments on your bones. And while it's really hard to correlate these to specific activities, there are some generalizations that can be made. And I wanna to talk to you about the Mary Rose for a minute because I think it's a really interesting example of how this can be used archeologically. So the Mary Rose is a Tudor battleship from England. It sunk in 1545. Uh, it is currently on display in Portsmouth. Um, highly recommend it if you ever get the chance to go see it. And they recovered 179 skeletons from the battleship. Now, during this time period, one of the most important military uh, technologies was the English longbow. The English longbow was a truly amazing bit of kit. It could pierce through uh, plate armor. But the draw weight on English longbows is insanely heavy. So it takes a lot of muscle to use one. And if you were an archer serving on the Mary Rose, which was a very prestigious warship, you would have been training since you were a small child. And as with corsets, activities that you start when you're growing tend to have a much bigger effect on the bones than activities you do as adults. So when they looked at the skeletons on the Mary Rose, they found a proportion of them had really, really musculature, uh, muscular arms, and especially very overdeveloped shoulders. So these are the kinds of um, sort of changes you're looking at, very, very pronounced on the humerus, so that's your upper arm bone, and really big muscle attachments on the radius uh, there, and on the ulna there and of course on the collarbone. And this is one of the skeletons from the Mary Rose. And if you look closely, you can see that actually the right shoulder is somewhat higher than the left. That's because it's bigger. It's not just how they've mounted the skeleton, it's that that side of the skeleton is way more developed. And even if you look at this nice reconstruction they've done of the individual, you can see that one shoulder is actually higher and bigger than the other. They think that these people were the archers. But they aren't the only people on the Mary Rose that they were able to work out what their role on the ship was based on their bones. 
They also found a selection of six skeletons that had um, changes to the lower spine that were consistent with lots of heavy lifting. So they found the bigger muscle attachments that I'm talking about, but also something called Schmorl's nodes, uh, which are little depressions in the vertebral bodies, and they correlate with physical activity. Um, and they think these people were actually the ship's gunmen, because moving around heavy uh, barrels of gunpowder and cannons and cannonballs would have been much heavier work than the other work on the ship. So you can start to sort of piece together the sorts of things people did in their lives just from looking at their skeletons, which is pretty cool. But it's not just things like archery and, you know, lugging heavy things around. Also, how you stand and how you sit can have a massive impact. So this is a modification called a squatting facet. This is the bottom of your leg, uh, your tibia, which is your lower leg bone. And this is your talus, which is the top of your ankle. And you just get these little notches and these little sort of slightly raised bits. And these are from squatting, basically, or kneeling. Um, you can see in this picture, this is a really good example. And they're really, really common, um, particularly in prehistoric populations. And they think that some of this has to do uh, with activities like grinding grain. So this woman in Mexico is using a very traditional uh, cornstone to grind some grain. That's the sort of corn that would have been very common in prehistory. They're still in use today in some parts of the world. But not just that. They did a study in France where they looked at tons and tons of archaeological skeletons from all periods to look at how common these squatting facets were. And they found that they were really common in the entire population up until the 15th century. And then they started getting less common. And then in sort of the 18th, 19th century, they disappeared completely. And they were trying to work out why this was. And then they realized it correlated with when stoves were introduced. So stoves, obviously, you cook at standing up. Before stoves, people cooked on fires and hearths. That necessitated squatting which would have impacted their bones. And cooking is an activity that most of the population probably would have engaged in. So you can really see sometimes how technology changes just from how your bodies and how people use their bodies change. You can also see a lot about people's habits and, and sometimes their jobs from looking at their teeth. So this example down here is one of the most extreme cases I've ever seen. Uh, these are from Spain, around 2000 BC, um, and they found most of the women on this site had these particular weird grooves in their teeth. Uh, none of the men did, which is interesting. What they think caused it was that women were using their teeth to help process plant fibers to make thread. And as they pulled them through their teeth, eventually they wore these grooves in. And what they were able to tell from this is A, men were not involved in this particular task, and B, uh, that women were starting around adolescence and continued to do it throughout their life. And they were able to see the differing wear patterns um, on teenagers that weren't that extreme to these, which are from older individuals. You can also sometimes see, um, in some populations, again, particularly prehistoric populations, where they've used their teeth for things like scraping hides uh, and other sort of processing tasks because you get uneven wear. But it's not just in prehistory that you can see these things. This skeleton here has this wonderful, perfectly circular hole in their teeth. And it was not caused by a drill or any sort of violence, uh, wasn't bad dental health, although you can see they've got a nice little cavity back here. It's actually from smoking tobacco, and not just because tobacco is not terribly good for your teeth, but because of the pipes they used. So this is a ceramic tobacco pipe. They're one of the most common archaeological finds you find in England on any post-medieval site. After tobacco is introduced in the 16th century to the UK, it just wildly takes off, and these pipes were tended to be very cheap and disposable, so you find a lot of them. 
but when people smoked them, they used to clamp down on them with their teeth. And ceramic is a very hard material, and eventually it wears your teeth away. So people that were habitual smokers would develop, oops, uh, what we call um, pipe stem facets in their teeth. And you can see their skeletons, and you can see it. It's quite obvious. So all these little habits sort of add up. Teeth are also really good for looking at uh, diet as well as tool use. Um, one interesting thing about teeth is that if you lose them when you're alive, your jaw does actually heal. So you can tell when you're looking at a skeleton if people have lost teeth during their lifetime, as opposed to these ones here, which were definitely lost um, after they died, probably due to excavation and decomposition and all that. So it might surprise you to learn that people in the past, particularly people pre the Columbian exchange, tend to have better teeth than modern populations. Um, this is because they didn't have easy access to sugar. While there were sugars in their diet, um, from carbohydrates like grain, uh, it tended to be from things like honey or dates. And these tended to be things that were more luxury items rather than things people had every day. So often you get very high status individuals with very bad teeth um, in certain periods of history because they were the people that had the money to to have sweet things. Uh, this changes once sugar is introduced and it becomes cheaper. And you actually get different patterns of where cavities are um, because, for instance, in the Victorian period, people used to give children rag soaked in sugar water, so they tend to get cavities between their teeth because the sugar was dissolved as opposed to this. These are um, Roman, where the cavities tend to be on the chewing surface of the teeth. You also tend to get tooth wear. Um, this is more common in the past because when people ground grain, they did it on stone cornstone, so you get grit in your grain. And again, this can be useful for looking at status because higher status people tended to eat more expensive bread, which was made with better material. The flour was ground with less gritty querns, and they tend to have less grit in. Certainly for some periods, um, it does correlate heavily with status. Uh, and toothware can also be useful for looking at tooth as uh, tools, as we just talked about. But the last thing, sort of very important with teeth, is that you get this built up if you don't brush your teeth. This is called calculus. What it is is mineralized plaque. Uh, images like this always make me just want to go immediately brush my teeth. But calculus is really interesting, right? You tend to get it from having soft foods, because if you eat lots of hard foods like apples, that sort of naturally cleans it away. And often looking at where it is in people's mouths can sort of help tell a story. So this individual is, again, Roman. All their calculus is on one side of their mouth. These teeth look really bad. So it's very likely that this person had trouble eating. It was probably painful. So they're only chewing on one side of their mouth and they're eating a lot of soft foods. And this can sort of help, again, reconstruct stories. And it's not just people. So the site I'm currently looking at, if you don't mind a site aside, has some dogs that have a lot of dental calculus and their teeth are incredibly worn and very bad. And it's very clear that they must have been somebody's pets that somebody cared deeply about because they're being fed soft foods that they can still eat, despite the fact that their teeth are completely ruined, which is quite interesting. One of the coolest things that bones can tell you, though, is that they can actually tell you where somebody grew up. Um, basically, when your teeth are forming, when you're a child, they take minerals from your body to do so. And a lot of these minerals your body gets from what you eat and drink. Now, drinking water um, would have been groundwater in the past. And groundwater from different places has different levels of strontium isotopes. And by looking at the strontium isotopes in teeth, you can actually correlate this with uh, geological maps and work out where people grew up. So the ivory bangle lady 
is was actually quite controversial um when she was first talked about she is from york in england she's fourth century ad now when they dug her up uh she had a fabulously wealthy grave and it was filled with a lot of things from north africa particularly uh items made of ivory and they were a bit suspicious that she might not be local to york because of this she was about 18 to 23 years old when she died so she wasn't actually very old so they looked at her isotopes and she wasn't from york um they actually showed that she was probably from the mediterranean uh maybe coastal western europe or at least that's where she grew up before presumably moving to the cold and rainy climes of York. That must have been a shock to the system. And finally, recently, they've just run her DNA, and it's kind of confirmed what the isotope said. Um, her heritage is is North African. Um, she was a migrant to Britain. And it's quite cool that you can see where people grew up, because it does let you sort of start to track migration. DNA will only tell you sort of where your ancestors uh, were from. It won't tell you where a person is from, but isotopes will give you an actual location, which is quite cool. Bones are also really good, unsurprisingly, for looking at health and healthcare, um, particularly broken bones. That's the most obvious one. Broken bones in the archaeological record are generally fairly easy to spot. Uh, this lower leg is from my sample and it's not particularly well healed. You can see from the x-ray, the fracture has gone straight through. This is um, the two bo bones of the lower leg. It's probably come through on an angle and neither bone is healed in the correct position. Um, this person probably didn't receive particularly good medical care uh, after they had this injury. They did live long enough for the bone to heal but it's not completely healed and also there is some slight infection there um slightly bubbly it's kind of hard to see on the photo in contrast we do actually have evidence for people splinting bones uh from very early on so the earliest example we have of bone splinting is from 300 bc and it's this one I've got photos of. Uh, this is a leg bone, this is an arm bone. They are from two different bodies found in Naga el Der in Egypt. And they were both buried with their splints intact. And because of the very hot, arid climate of Egypt, the splints survived and we can see them. Now, unfortunately, both individuals must have died not long after the splints were applied. There's no healing uh, visible on the bones. But because of that, they were buried in splints, which does give us a unique insight into the medical care at the time. Well-healed bones do show up in the archaeological record. We know that people were setting and, and treating bones, um, but they're much harder to see, uh, which is why I haven't necessarily included an example for you guys. Because if a bone heals well, it pretty much just looks like a regular bone unless you x-ray it. You can also see surgery in the past, and these are both uh, quite old examples. They're both prehistoric. The skull is from Jericho in Israel and is from between 2200 and 2000 BC. And it has what's called trepanning. So these holes in the head that you can see uh, are three surgical interventions. And they would have been done with a tool like this flint blade here. This would have been done with no anesthetic uh, and no sort of antiseptic. And yet this person survived and survived for a long time after, because again, you can see quite clear signs of healing. The edges are nice and rounded. There's no sign of infection. We don't necessarily know why people trepanned. Um, it's really widespread in the prehistoric period. You see it all over. And trepanning is still used in some medical cases today. Um, if you have something like meningitis that causes swelling to the brain, uh, trepanning can relieve that pressure and can be life-saving. We don't know if that's why people were doing it in prehistory. It might actually be the case um, for this individual, though, because as you can see here, 
this dent, uh, that's healed blunt force trauma. So it, the holes might have been a response to the fact this person was hit quite hard in the head. The other example I've got up here for you is actually even older. So that's 31,000 years old. And this individual has an amputation. Their left leg has been amputated, lower leg and foot. This is from Borneo. Uh, this is a hunter-gatherer person from prehistoric Bor Borneo. So it's pretty astounding that not only did they have their leg amputated, but actually looking at the level of healing. So again, you can see it's got these nice rounded edges. This probably was amputated in childhood, um, whereas the skeleton was an adult. And they probably lived with it for a long time. And one thing that I find really interesting about this, aside from the fact that they managed to amputate somebody's leg in the middle of a jungle 31,000 years ago and keep it clean enough that it didn't get infected, is that this person must have been looked after by their society. You probably wouldn't, the amount of time this would take to heal before you were functional again, you definitely would have to be looked after. And hunter-gatherer life is very difficult. Um, so when people sort of talk about, oh, survival of the fittest, with humans, it's always been survival of the most cooperative. And this really shows that. Which brings me to my next point, is that looking at skeletons does allow us to look at disability in the past. You know, it's not something that's really often talked about, but it is there in the skeletal record. So this individual is nowhere near as old. Um, they are from 1822. But there are a really interesting case, again, of somebody that must have very visibly been disabled. So their left leg, as you can see, is a different size to their right. It's very thin. Um, the bones are almost not there. They're so thin. There's no real big muscle attachments. And actually, if you showed me the left and right leg of this individual, and I didn't know that they were the same person, I would have said that they were from two different skeletons. It's very, very unusual to have um, this sort of asymmetry. And unfortunately, you can't really see it in the photo, because um, I couldn't fit the whole skeleton in one photo. But the upper body of this individual looks perfectly normal. Again, it's symmetrical. And there's nothing odd about it. So this person was paralyzed. Uh, their left leg was paralyzed. What I was saying about the activity in the longbow man with if you have lots of muscle, your bones get big, the opposite is true too. If your muscles atrophy, so do your bones. And this person must have survived with this condition for a long time for it to be this extreme because bone changes very slowly. So given where this person is from, which is a suburb of London, and when, 1822, and the symptoms, a paralyzed left leg, it's very likely that this person had polio, um, which is, again, a really interesting one, because you don't necessarily think of polio as being that old a disease. Um, when people think about polio, they usually think about the 1950s and iron lungs, um, but people were dealing with it um, in much older sort of contexts. The Industrial Revolution um, really changed things for humanity in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of the modern world is built off the Industrial Revolution, but the Industrial Revolution was unsurprisingly very bad for health. It might be the period in which we worked out germ theory and that sanitation is a good idea, but also quite a lot of the working practices were quite bad for health. And you can actually see that really in some of the diseases that become a lot more prevalent. And one of those is rickets. So rickets is a um, metabolic condition. It's malnutrition, basically. And it's what happens if you don't have enough vitamin D. Your bones can't mineralize properly, so they bend. Um, normally like bones, because that's where most of your weight is. Um, but you can get 
it affecting other bones too. Now, while rickets is a malnutrition issue, vitamin D can be a dietary problem. Actually, the main cause of vitamin D deficiency is lack of sunlight. So the reason we see rickets spike up so badly during the Industrial Revolution is actually a reflection on working practices. So many children worked in factories um, and they didn't basically get enough daylight and um, you can see it in their bones. These are uh, all leg bones. This is the fibula, which is a lower leg bone, and this is the femur again. Both these bones should be straight. Um, so you can see how changing conditions can affect the body. You can also sometimes correlate diseases with their treatments. I hesitate to say cures because what I'm going to tell you about is not a cure. Syphilis, um, very, very nasty disease uh, and very, very common in the Industrial Revolution, particularly in London. Uh, estimates from the 18th century sometimes are as high as one in five Londoners having syphilis. Um, you can get syphilis one of two ways. Uh, you're either born with it and you have something called congenital syphilis, um, which you inherit from a parent that has syphilis. And that can be quite devastating. It can cause blindness as well as a number of other um, deformities. Um, and then there's venereal syphilis, uh, which was an STD. And syphilis has lots of stages and it's only tertiary syphilis, so really bad syphilis that tends to show up on bones. But when you see it, it does tend to be quite extreme. So you get infections in the tibia. These sort of dark knobbly patches are all um, infection. And you get what's called caries sicca on the skull, which are these really distinctive lesion, uh, lesions that are sort of, again, kind of bubbly and they're very horrible. But because we can recognize syphilis in the archaeological population, A, it allows us to sort of look at how prevalent it was, and it is extremely prevalent. But also it allows us to maybe look at how people treated it and how common those treatments were. So we know from historical documents that the treatment for syphilis usually involved mercury, either taking it um, and ingesting it or breathing in mercury fumes. Now, mercury is poisonous uh, and it's a heavy metal so it accumulates in your bones and actually there have been some really interesting chemical studies that have looked at what chemicals are in bones and have found a correlation between the mercury building up and people with syphilis so again archaeologically we can start to recognize these treatments and also this could be quite useful now that we've proven it in the victorian population where we know this is a thing, um, to sort of start applying it to older populations and maybe look at other things. Um, for instance, there's an interesting study to be done between lead and Roman populations. Romans loved using lead for everything, including sweetening their wine. Lastly, I want to finish up by talking about two case studies from the War of the Roses. The War of the Roses was a civil war in England between 1455 and 1487 between two branches of the House Plantag Plantagenet. So there was the York branch and the Lancaster branch. Uh, if you've ever seen Shakespeare's history plays, you might be familiar with some of this. And the first skeleton I want to talk to you about is from Towton. Towton has the dubious distinction of being the bloodiest battle ever fought on British soil. Um, it was extremely violent, and when the Yorkists won, they killed most of the Lancaster captives that they had taken, and there is a mass grave that was excavated by the University of Bradford, and that has led to some very interesting research on medieval warfare. What I want to talk to you about, though, is a specific skeleton, Towton 16. So he was found in the mass grave. He was probably one of the Lancastrians that was captured. He looks like he was killed after he was captured as opposed to in battle because um, he was killed by a very violent blow to the back of the head. And it looks like an execution. But that's not what is interesting about Towton 16. What is interesting about Towton 16 is this. This is a sword wound 
a really bad sword wound to his jaw that is really, really well healed. So you can see in this reconstruction that they've done of his face, he has this really impressive scar. This tells us a couple of things. One, Towton 16 was probably in a fair number of fights. Uh, you generally don't get sword wounds like that, just, you know, walking down to the corner store or what have you. Uh, two, that this wound was expertly treated. We are talking about the medieval period, a period which people really, the medical um, care was maybe not the best. They're still working off for humor's theory. Uh, leeches are very, very popular. This sword wound would have been very serious, probably would have required stitches, and it hasn't gotten infected. There is zero sign of infection on that bone. And the thing about infection is that it tends to stick around. Even if you heal from it, you can see it. So this means he probably wasn't infected at all. And it also tells us he had money and he was someone important because medical care like that wouldn't have been cheap and they wouldn't have done it for just everybody. And he must have had the resources to be able to survive while this was healing. Because again, it would have probably been a long and painful process. So most of the theories say that he was either a mercenary, as I allude to in the slide title, or um, that he might have been some high-level retainer. But he certainly was a man that led an interesting and storied life. And lastly, I'm going to finish up with probably the most famous example of osteological analysis, uh, Richard III. So Richard III was briefly King of England, and he was killed in the... Battle of Bosworth Fields, um, and that's when the Tudors sort of start their reign of England. Now, they didn't know Richard III was in the uh, site, <laughs> rather famously, under the car park in Leicester. But when they were digging, they found a skeleton that they were a little suspicious of. Now, the skeleton in question was a male skeleton, around 30 to 34 uh, probably the individual would have been about five foot eight inches. Lots and lots of cavities, not great dental health. And most interestingly, scoliosis. So the curvature on the spine is not quite right. Now, scoliosis, it's not a terribly uncommon condition, but it's not very common in the archaeological record, particularly. And it's not really what you'd expect to find in a battlefield uh, cemetery, which this was. So they did some DNA testing um, and they found out that it was indeed Richard III. And there are some really interesting things about his skeleton. First of all, Shakespeare was maybe exaggerating a little bit. There's no withered arm, no sign of a limb. And actually, despite the fact he had scoliosis, he wouldn't have had a hunch. Um, he would have had one shoulder higher than the other. It wouldn't have been completely invisible, but it certainly wouldn't have been the very exaggerated uh, deformities that Shakespeare describes in his plays. Um, we know he was killed to a blow to the head. He actually has nine uh, wounds on his head, one on his pelvis and one to his spine. Um, quite a violent death. This is probably the one that killed him, but it, it's hard to say. You can't really do cause of death from bones alone because there are so many ways to die that don't impact your skeleton. Um, one thing that is really interesting, though, is that he had roundworms. So you would think if you were king, you wouldn't have parasites, but that's not true. Um, they took soil samples, uh, in his sort of pelvic area where his intestines would have been, and they found quite a few roundworm eggs. So despite being king and despite having a fabulous diet, they also did testing of the carbon and nitrogen, um, in his bones. And they found that his diet, while always good, um, there's a period in which it suddenly spikes up for fish, uh, signatures for fish and terrestrial proteins. So he's eating a lot more meat and they think that's when he became king. And obviously he has access to sugar because his teeth are bad. 
but even so, he's still suffering from the sorts of health issues that you would get. So I really hope that I've been able to share with you today just how much we can learn from looking at a skeleton and how we can start to put people's stories uh, together just from looking at their bones and the sorts of things that we can tell about people, even though they're not here to tell us our story. Um, I would be delighted to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ellen. I think I have a much better idea now of why you chose this as your field of study. It, it really is incredibly interesting. Um, I, thank you. As, as people, are, everybody, you're welcome to put your questions into Q&A now is the time to do that. Um, I know Ellen would be glad to answer your questions. Um, I, I just was kind of stunned at, at how interesting this was. So thank you. Um, I, I want people to, to remind people also that of while well, all eight of um, Ellen's lectures are not available on videotape because we didn't start doing that until COVID times, um, uh, a, a few of them are on our YouTube channel. So if you want more Ellen, um, please look on the library's YouTube channel and uh, you can find the one on dogs and the one on warrior women and um, all torque no trousers is on there and quite a few. So all good stuff. Um, I did wonder, Ellen, do you, I know it's just theory, theorizing for for um, the scientists, but um, did they have any idea why the Frankenstein mummy would have been constructed like that? It's such a strange case. Uh, this, anybody in the audience who uh, is familiar with archaeological archaeological literature is going to think this is a massive cop-out, but actually most of the theories say that it was for ritual purposes, which is generally how archaeologists say we don't know. There's no logical reason why you would do that, uh, so it probably is something religious. Interesting. Um, what are you working on right now? Um, at the moment, I am looking at a Roman site um, that has a quarry pit that is full of bones, human and animal, and I am trying to reconstruct the processes uh, behind how those bones came to be there. Um, and it's really interesting because it looks like what they're doing is putting bodies in there, letting them decompose, and then removing the skulls. And we have no idea why. It's a very un-Roman thing to be doing as well. Um, it it kind of flies in the face of uh, a lot of previously assumed assumptions about the the time period in England, which is quite interesting. Maybe not as monolithic a culture as they thought. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So Catherine wants to know what made you fall in love with bioarchaeology. Um. During my undergrad, the university I went to put a large emphasis on archaeological theory and on the less certain bits of archaeology. And the upshot of this is that when I took a bioarchaeology class and they were like, this is science, I never wanted to leave. Um, I was just very glad to be dealing with um, things that were measurable and that I could look at. Um, and then it sort of grew from that. I'm really interested in uncovering these stories, as you say. Um, it's amazing what you can learn about people just from their skeletons. Clearly. Thank you. Um, Jill asks, uh, have you ever come across a, a broken femur bone that's that has healed? This, this uh, shows cooperation among people, of course, so that, that person could survive. Um, uh yeah i have come across some broken femurs um broken bones are not super uncommon in the archaeological record um i don't work with anything particularly that old though um we know that the romans had a pretty good sense of medical care um the iron age may be a little less so but you would be surprised again you do find evidence of, of, of healing and of efforts being made to help set bones. 
the those um bone splints from 300 BC were fascinating. They looked entirely ineffective, but well-meaning. Again, you'd be surprised. We have tons of examples from Egypt of really well-healed bones. Hmm. So ineffective in those cases, though those were also nasty breaks that were very badly infected. So yeah. Right. <laughs> um, what were some of the oldest bones you've ever worked with and where were they from? So I worked on some Bronze Age bones from Transylvania. So again, that would have been about 1000 BC um, when I was an undergrad and those were pretty amazing. They were very fragmentary though. The preservation was not great. So I, you weren't necessarily able to get the types of information, uh, some of the types of information I've been talking about, but pretty cool. Do you have a, Rowena, Rowena wants to know, do you have a favorite skeleton? Um, I do. It's one of my PhD skeletons. Um, it is a 45 plus year old woman with a well-heeled broken nose and a well-heeled stab wound in her hand that was found in the middle of my quarry shaft uh, face down. And she seems to have led quite an exciting life. Um, and if I had a time machine, I'd love to know who she was because she is, she's got really, really musk, uh, very robust bones. She must have been really muscular and she looks like she definitely had a few stories to tell, uh, not least of which is why she ended up face down in the middle of a quarry shaft full of dead things. Sounds like one of your warrior women. I think she might have been, but you know, it's hard to tell. Um, how about how modern, how do modern diets affect our bones? Now you probably haven't excavated those, but you might have some theories. So the isotopic stuff would work exactly the same for modern bones as it would for ancient bones. Um, you could tell where somebody grew up if they grew up in a place long enough with the same water source and you could tell diet wise how much of their diet was marine how much was animal protein and how much was uh plants so if you're vegetarian your bones would show that which i think is pretty cool would they be like healthier bones or they wouldn't necessarily be healthier. They'd have a slightly different chemical uh, makeup, which you could tell doing chemical analysis. You wouldn't be able to tell with the naked eye. Yeah. Um, why are scoliosis findings so rare? You mentioned that with Richard the Third, and, uh, um, and you know, and by the way, that skeleton, the the, the photo that you showed, it looked extreme. Um, the the spinal curvature looked extreme to my untutored eye, but. Um, you said it, it does look quite back. extreme, but you yeah. have to keep in mind that human spines are naturally a bit curvy. So when you lay them out like that, even if there's nothing wrong with them, they look curvy. Oh, okay. Because um, the human spine should, in a healthy person, make a slight S shape. But it's the curve is in the wrong place on that one. Ah. Um, scoliosis findings are probably rare because it's hard to recognize if you don't have the whole spine. I suspect there are more cases in the archaeological records than we've necessarily noticed, because if you often you'll only get one or two vertebrae from a body if preservation is bad. OK, thanks. Um, Judy wants to know, have you read the book Horse, which I think is by Geraldine Brooks, because it has a skeleton that tells quite a tale? Uh, I have not, but I'll add it to my reading list. OK. I, I know that um, uh, one of our readers advisory people, um, Sarah Lipson, loved that book. So if you want a novel version of what, what Ellen does, try that. Um, Catherine asks, what is the most famous misconception in your field that you would like to correct? Take a minute if you need it. <laughs> oh, there are two that really bother me. <laughs> one is that everyone in the ancient world died at 30. When you get life expectancies for uh, the past, they're inevitably really skewed by high infant mortality. It's not that everyone died the day they hit 30. It's that lots of people 
died when they were babies. And so when you look at the averages, it's pushed way down. Um, and the other one is that we can always do cause of death because we really can't. There are so, so many things that can kill a person uh, that just don't show up on bones and never would. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And then um, finally, um, uh, Sunny asks, after you get your PhD, what's next for you? Are you going to be teaching or investigating for the police or writing for Hollywood? Or <laughs> what do you think? So the two main career pathways I'm looking at the moment is I would like to stay in academia. I love teaching. Mm. Um, and I would really like to continue my research because I think um, there's some really interesting questions I'd like to address. Um, but also, I might go back into field archaeology, uh, which I was doing before my PhD, um, because they often need skeletal specialists to write up. And it, it's quite nice to actually be on the, the cutting edge and looking at the things that are coming out as they're coming out, um, which is really only possible if you work in industry. Very well, you, you certainly are a good teacher, um, and uh, but also I know that you're you find great happiness being down in a pit. So um, perhaps a combination of the two. Ellen Green, thank you very very much for returning, and um, uh, I think that probably a lot of people in the audience are very grateful to you as well. Um, we hope to see you again sometime. So thank you. Thank you very much. So long, everyone. Thank you.